worship Christ the King. Alleluia, amen. Praises to him we bring. Alleluia, amen. With grateful heart and voice, before his throne rejoice. Praise is his gracious choice. Alleluia, amen. On fire, come on up. Now, as you come up, you might kind of look around because there's a treasure in the room somewhere. Not so sure? Or you just didn't believe me? <laughs> what treasure? What treasure? Okay, if you were going to find treasure in this room, how would you know where to look? Can you scoot around just a little, Kate? Come on up. A map. Well, what if you didn't have a map? You don't know. You look for what? You don't have to wait until you find it. <laughs> look for what? An X. An X. X mark. That's what, it, yep. X marks the spot. Hello there. Sorry, wait. I'm glad you came anyway. Is there an X marks the spot right here? Is there an X marks the spot? Do you see an X in the floor anywhere? I see lots of dots. Uh, no, no X. X. How else would you find a treasure in here? Look for it? Why would you do that? Maybe it's behind one of the chairs. If behind one of the chairs? Nope. No, under. Under. Okay. Hmm. Would it be safe to say they shouldn't look under the chairs? Vicky. Would that be safe to say not to look under chairs? I don't know that I really want to turn them loose to do that. I'm oh, just we thinking. see it. We see it. What? Right there. No, 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 no. That's not it. Yeah, it is. Oh, that's not it. You don't even know what you're looking for. Yeah, we are. Treasure. And what? we know that bag is. We Treasure. know that bag is. I can hear you guys. We know that bag is. <laughs> I just can't hear it. We are going to, we're going to study a passage today in Hebrews 11, and we're going to talk about a guy that looked and looked and looked and looked, and he didn't know where he was going, and he didn't know for sure what he was looking for, and he didn't know when he would find it. Then what's to go bad for? It's not the treasure. That is Brittany's purse, and I suggest you leave it alone. Right? Yep. She's wearing sunglasses, you know. Mm. All right. He's really bothered by that shiny object down there. Okay, I'm going to let you go. Huh. Miss Vicky hid something, and I'll give you a couple of minutes to see if you can find it. All right? Go for it. That's all the hints I'm going to give you. Except don't look under chairs. <laughs> no treasure there? Brennan is going to, he's going to cover the room. You didn't find it? Huh. Do you know what you're looking for yet? A treasure. A <laughs> treasure. You can't find it either? Oh. Did she find it? All right. Chelsea found it. I guess she gets it. Okay. All right. Y'all go sit down. Go sit with your family, wherever you're supposed to be sitting. This Wherever you came from this morning, go back there. <laughs> Treasure hunt is over. Oh, I've really, I've really turned them on now. They're not going to go off easy. <laughs> explain it, explain it, explain it. All right, let me, let me do a couple of things from the last week, and I'll, uh, and I'll come back to the treasure. We're going to read a verse about it. So we've been in Hebrews 11, the, the uh, Hall of Fame of the Heroes of Faith. The last three weeks we've looked at, or two weeks, we've looked at Abel and Enoch, Abel who pleased God, Enoch who walked with God. 
Last week we looked at Noah and how he responded to the Word of God and, and the word obeyed was used. Now, you know, we, it, it's kind of funny. We start talking about treasure and what would be the last place you would go look? Um, those of you that were here when Salvador was here a couple of Wednesday nights ago, this is one of his pictures. So how many of you would be looking there? I, I believe this may be some of the streets of Fort Worth. I'm not sure. Who lives in tents? At least on the uh, news today. <laughs> The homeless, yeah. Um, I'm going to forever change your view of our hero of faith because this is the view of Hebrews 11. Abraham followed God. Abraham, reading about him in Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called obeyed by going out to a place he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land. And we, we talked about this in our lesson this morning in, in class. He was in the promised land, but it wasn't really the promised land yet. And he, he lived as if it wasn't his land. I, I, to continue the theme of the homeless, <laughs> they live in places that don't belong to them. That's why owners tend to come and say, you can't be here. I, I don't want you in my things. I don't want you tearing up my things. I don't want you messing up my things. I don't want what you leave behind. This is not your place. Now, and, I, and I'm serious to say, I really want to change our view of Abraham because let me tell you, that's the way they looked at him. Now, he got pretty powerful and he got pretty wealthy, but he, he was still not living in his own place. And yet, we look back on it and we say, well, that was his land. That was the land of promise. That was his inheritance. That's what God promised him. We'll come back to the tent. So the treasure this morning was some... Is this right, Vicki? Did you hide the, uh, the, the little books and the coloring things that, that, that the kids that are sitting with her are going to work with this morning? I said, where are they? She said, well, they're right here in front of me. <laughs> I said, well, move them, and I'll tell the kids to come and find them. But I didn't tell them what it was. And it's that feeling that Abraham must have felt. I'm looking for a place, but I don't know what I'm going to find. I don't know what it looks like. And when I see it, I'm actually not going to know that I'm actually looking at it. Because I don't know what I'm looking for. I, I don't understand. All that God has in mind in this, in this set of verses here. So Abraham, and this just in 8 and 9 here, he left his home. He traveled blind. He didn't know where he was going. He just, he just went. How many of you go on vacation and you have no idea where you're going to go? You just get in the car. Okay, which way is it pointing? All right, we're going that way. Well, you just drove through your house. <laughs> I mean, we've we got to have, have a goal, right? We, we're going on vacation, but we're going to go see certain things. We, we know we're going to go here, we're going to go here, we're going to stay here. Now, we may take a diversion... But we know where we're going. He didn't have that luxury. He completely traveled blind. And he lived as an alien, and I'm using that word because it's all over our news. It's the word in the text, but it's the word stranger. He, he wasn't really welcome in the places where he went. And so it goes on to the, re the rest of verse 9 says that he, he was dwelling in tents. But catch this, with Isaac and Jacob... Well, not for a while. Isaac was born 25 years after he started looking. And Jacob was born after that. This would be his son and his grandson. 
But there was a time, we think about, well, Abraham lived in tents and he was out there as an alien. No, there was a time when multiple generations were out chasing the same promise. And they were all living in the same camp. In the same set of tents. They were watching out for each other, but they were all looking for the same thing at the same time. Isaac and Jacob were fellow heirs of the same promise. In your descendants, all the nations of the earth were blessed. He was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. I, I, get a, I get a picture when I hear that verse of Abraham thinking, you know, someday I'm going to come up on the horizon, except there aren't a lot of those in Palestine. <laughs> it's pretty flat in some of the areas he was traveling in. And boom, there's going to be this wow city. And it's going to be obvious. Only God could have built something that humongous, that wonderful, that nice. And he spent his life, he never arrived. Really. Except he was there the whole time. One way that some people look at it is, Abraham got the luxury of being given an inheritance and he spent his entire life and never really got to see all of what he was given. Like, you know, he went to survey the property. Except it took his whole life to do it. That's how big it was. It's a long time that we're talking about here. So he says, where am I going? No answer. When am I going to get there? No answer. How is this going to happen? How is this inheritance going to occur? Where is this promise going to be fulfilled? I don't understand how this is going to work. How are we doing this? No answer. And so for Abraham, the unseen was, the instructions will come as you need them. He lived in a tent because when God said, okay, we're going to go again. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm laughing because you know what your first question would be. Okay, where? But we're reading that that's not the answer Abraham got. That he just went. God said, okay, we're moving. All right. And away we went. Now, I don't... I, I, you ladies, you wives are wonderful, wonderful people. But I cannot imagine your husband coming home and you saying, okay, we're moving. And doesn't give you the answer where. I, I'm just not seeing that flying. Are you? And the husbands are all going, <laughs> uh-uh. This, this is the promise. Abraham is with his family. And one of the things that's propelling him, according to the verse we just read, he dwelled in, in these tents with, with his family. One of the things that propels him is his thought of, of the idea of family. This, this is for my child. This is for my grandchildren. This is for my great-grandchildren. And I'm looking for that city that's God's. I'm looking for it. And that was his life. The life of Abraham. But we're not leaving anyone out. Verse 11 goes on to say, By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who had promised. And, of course, that's God. Now, most people read this verse and they say, yeah, but Sarah laughed, so she was unfaithful. That's not what Hebrew says. Hebrew says she was faithful. So let me, let me remind you that, that in, the, in the absence of information sometimes, in the absence of our understanding about where we're going and what we're doing and why these things work the way they do, we might have questions. We might even laugh at some of the things that God says He's going to do. But remember that in that text in Genesis, God said, yeah, you will. And she believed according to Hebrews. That was her response. So our, our initial reaction is notwithstanding is, is not, a, not a problem. God didn't bristle and say, that's it. Lightning from heaven comes down and consumes Sarah's tent. Now we've got to go find another wife, you know. No, she, she laughed, and 
there was an answer. And remember, this is from a different tent. And Hebrews says, she believed God. She considered him faithful. He's going to do what he says he's going to do. And she stood with her family. And that's a, that's a testament. Sometimes families choose a course and different ones have different commitment and different ones have different endurance and different ones have different ideas about how they would do it. But if you're going to stand with your family and you're going to serve God, then that's going to require a level of faith and commitment and trust that exceeds just one guy out there by himself in a tent. This is a whole clan of people. Now this promise in Hebrews 11 is longer than life. I've, I've said it in two or three ways. Abraham spent his whole life, in a sense, not really receiving the promise. That's what Hebrews says. In fact, all of these, it says, didn't get what was promised in its complete form. But before we end Abraham's story in verse 17, we come back to him again and we say, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, who he had received the promises, was offering up his only begotten son. Where have you seen that phrase, only begotten son? Yeah. You see, God told Abraham, you take that one son you waited 25 years for, and now he's, shall we say, a teenager, and you go take him where I'm going to show you, and you offer him on the altar. You take his life and give him to me. And Abraham made the trip, and he did everything God said, and he offered his son. God just didn't require the actual offering when it got right down to it. Because if you're going to go to all that trouble and you're going to take your servant and you're going to go up the mountain and you're going to pull the knife out and you're going to light the fire for the offering, you, you, you did it. God doesn't require, in that case, the completion of the offering. But Abraham got credit for the offering even though he didn't actually finish it. It was his only begotten son and the next time an only begotten son gets offered, we go through with it. And it's God who offers. It was he who it was said, in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. So here's what Abraham thought. He considered God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he received him back as a type. Now, Abraham's pretty incredible. This verse tells us that Abraham said, okay, this is Isaac. Now, we've been through this. This is the, this is the child of promise. I mean, I had the Ishmael child, and God said, not him, this one. Isaac, this child. So what Abraham believes is, this is the child of promise. He believed God's promise. This child Isaac is the child of promise. So, that can't mean that I don't go back down the mountain with him. He left the servant and he said, we'll be back. <laughs> really? You taking him up there to offer him? What are you thinking? You thinking he's coming back. And Hebrews tells us that in Abraham's mind, there's only one way this can go, and that is... God must be able to raise from the dead. Has he ever seen that? No. But hes it's got to be Isaac. He wants me to offer him. He must be going to raise him from the dead. That, this, I mean, this is what's going to happen. You know, sometimes in, in our faith, we ask the question, how can God do this? How can God do this? How can God ask Abraham to offer Isaac? How can God expect me to live by faith blindly? <laughs> How can God expect me to, you know, make lemonade out of these lemons I've got? How can God do this? 
But what Abraham showed us is the real question and the real fun part about serving God is not how can he do this, how is God going to do what he said he's going to do? That's the wonderful part. I don't see how he can do it. Well, it's going to be really, it's going to be amazing to see how he is going to do what he's about to do. That's the fun part. I don't have enough money for that. What's going to be fun is to watch how God comes up with that money. And how many times has he done that, people? Raise your hand if that's happened to you. <laughs> Half of the room. That's the fun part of faith. When you get to the place of faith and you say, okay, he's going to do it, how's he going to do that? Well, it'd be fun to find out. We don't question can he because he's God. Of course he can. How is he going to do it? But you may have thought, and I always thought, yeah, this is a long time, and the, the where question, the when question, the how question. We're walking up the mountain with Isaac and the torch and the knife, and the question on our mind would be why? Why? Why would you want this? Maybe that's the hardest challenge that we have. When we start questioning what God is thinking. Well, I told my class this morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the passage in Scripture that tells us that those who are dead see what happens after their death. And I'm going to tell you, I, I, this is a question that has caused me a lot of concern in my life. I've been asked all of my ministry life, do people who have gone on before us see what happens after they're gone? And I've not known the answer to that. And I'm reading along about Abraham, and a reference comes up in the words of Jesus, and I'm thinking, that's kind of curious. I don't remember this reference. So I'm going to read it for you, and this is what we get. Jesus in John chapter 8, the Jews say to him, Now we know you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets also, and you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. And so what are they thinking? Abraham kept your word and he died. <laughs> Jesus said, three verses later, Your father Abraham rejoiced. To see my day. And, in case you're wondering really what that means, he saw it and was glad. Now those are the words of the Son of God, the one who came down from heaven, the one who knows what goes on in heaven, and he says, Abraham was watching and smiling. And so, maybe you've heard people say, well, you know, your, your loved ones are looking down on you, you want to give them a smile. Is there a biblical precedent for that? Right squarely in the words of Jesus. Now, I, I can speak for Abraham, <laughs> because Jesus did. I don't know about your Aunt Susie. I, I don't know. Can we generalize that? I, I would assume we could, but I don't know. I don't know for a fact. But what Jesus was saying with the Jews, and they were resisting him like crazy, we've just got this concept of life and life after death. It's just, just, it just really needs some education. We think you live, you die, that's it. Or we think you live, you die, and you go to heaven. But we don't think much about this part of it. And Jesus says, you don't understand that in the hands of God, this thing called life is much more wonderful than you've ever dreamed. And so like God watches us, like the cloud of witnesses watches us, chapter 12, Abraham was glad to see Jesus come to the earth and do what he was doing. He was cheerleading on the sidelines too. The last verse I want to read is verses 20 and 21. I want to call Isaac and Jacob and Esau and others into this. Because the Hebrew writer says, it's by faith that Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. 
and even regarding things to come beyond life, beyond their life pants. So we've got Abraham's life, we've got Isaac's life, we've got Jacob and Esau's life. We're talking about something happening that's longer than this span of time. And, and Isaac is telling Jacob and Esau about something that's going to be after them. Wow. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, and he worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. Jacob did not bless his own son, Joseph, you know, the second in command in Egypt. Jacob blessed his grandchildren. He blessed Ephraim and Manasseh. By the way, he blessed the younger over the older, same way he was. And he was blind. And so the descendants that were promised to Abraham includes the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. In fact, here are the generations. In Hebrews 11, we have Abraham and Sarah. We have Isaac in the next generation. We have Jacob and Esau and then third generation, the grandchildren of Abraham and Sarah. We have Joseph, the great-grandchild. And we have Ephraim and Manasseh, the great-great-grandsons. <coughs> Now, what, what, are, what are we talking about here? If this promise that these people are all looking for their whole life, it, it almost seems like God's a little bit mean. You made, made all these people look their whole life and they never got what, what you had in mind? It's not mean. It's just bigger than that. Your descendants will be like the sand of the seashore. How, can you see every, every grain of sand on all the seashores of the world? No. Can you see all the stars in the heavens? No. It's just bigger than that. And I'm telling you, folks, we are in the same promise with them. We live by faith. We take our tent down and we pitch it somewhere else. We look for where this money's going to come from because that need is in our lives. We bless our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren if we're blessed to have them. We live by faith. The promise is later. We look to heaven. We look to the city whose architect and builder is God. God didn't ask anything of Abraham that He doesn't ask of us. And when we look back on Abraham's life, we shouldn't see a homeless guy in a tent, even though that's what his neighbor saw. We should see a great hero of faith, who whatever he faced over decades and decades of life, he always looked to God, he always knew God was going to fulfill His promise, and he knew that someday he would understand what God's talking about. And the key is, he lived every day as if he knew what God was talking about. Or at least he understood enough to put one foot in front of the other. That's what following God looks like. So my question this morning is, will you follow God? And I know it's the point in our sermon when I usually say, will you come down to the front and will you obey Jesus? Will you confess your sin? Will you... Put him on in baptism. Will you, will you do the, you know, this thing that we can do here in a matter of minutes? I'm not... I, it's bigger than that. Because when you make that commitment, you're signing on for life and eternity. And so every decision, every move you make, every thing that occurs to you is in the context of God and His work in your life. And that's what following him looks like. That's the way Abraham did it. I do want to offer that invitation. And I do want you to begin following him. So like Abraham, I'm calling you on behalf of God, and it's your move to get up and go, not completely knowing where this leads, just knowing where it ends up. Will you come while we stand and sing? Worship Christ the King.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah.